For most of us, I think Halloween is a lifelong obsession. I know it's no different. For our next guest, who is writer, producer, director, Ted Doherty. Hello. Can you guys hear me okay? Awesome. Wow, this is cool. Yes, my name is uh, Ted Doherty. I'm a writer, producer, director for seasonal events and attractions. Thank you guys so much for hanging out. You know, when Haunt X first asked me to speak about like my personal life journey in this industry, I was very hesitant at first, because uh, I don't like to talk about myself like that. Uh, but certainly flattered that they thought enough of me to invite me to do something like this, but more importantly, I'm so honored that you guys are here, presuming that you want to hear a little bit about this wacky world of Halloween that I've been working in. Usually these uh, retrospectives, I think, are reserved for folks who are either retired or dead, so uh, I'm happy to report that the last time I checked, I'm still alive, and I'm really kind of only in the middle of this thing, so maybe we can look at this as like the halfway point. Uh, full disclosure, I usually speak at trade shows, uh, really kind of about my work experience and try to provide like an educational value to what I've worked on. So um, honestly, I'm a little out of my comfort zone just talking about me. So just kind of bear with me as I plow through this. And one of the ways I kind of tried to wrap my mind around uh, presenting this today was I picked out a handful of experiences that I've worked on and will provide some insight as to what I feel I've learned working on those experiences in hopes that maybe you get something out of it. Maybe what not to do, maybe. Um, and certainly if you're looking to get in this industry or you are in this industry, maybe there's something in there for you as well. Um, in the themed entertainment industry, we're always kind of searching for ways to improve and enhance the guest experience. It's something I'm always striving for, but for me, it started way back when with things like this. Yes. Look at that stud. That is me at nine years old rocking an amazing werewolf outfit for Halloween. Uh, always loved Halloween. Uh, that really kind of comes from my mom. She gave that to us kids. My dad just sort of tolerates it, uh, but that's uh, from my sister, my younger sister, to, uh, to me, to my older brother, so I'm kind of smack dab in the middle. And uh, yeah, we always loved Halloween. In fact, a couple of years before this photo was taken, my older brother and my mom turned our entire house into a home haunt named Castle Dracula. And so I was the star of the show, Count Dracula. Little old me, not a lot of people uh, attended. I don't think the neighbors were into that kind of thing, but. Uh, the point is, we've been into this for, for quite some time. I've always been fascinated with monsters, uh, especially like Frankenstein's monster. I always loved the way that he looked, as referenced in that photo, that drawing there in the upper right-hand corner. My mom says I did that about the age of two or three. And I didn't see Frankenstein until much later on, but I always loved the way he looked. And, and I saw a movie named The Howling way too young. It scarred me. It terrified me. Watching that character, Eddie Quist, like morph into this hideous werewolf was just astonishing. I mean, it, it was absolute nightmare material, and I was actually kind of phobic of werewolves for, for a long time. And But it did set a foundation for a special relationship I now have with werewolves that I'll talk about in, in a bit. Uh, but the older I got, I got a little bit more brave and started watching more of like the classic scary horror movies as well as like the gory horror movies. Loved like Dawn of the Dead, the original, because it had this killer special effects gore. It was horror mixed kind of with action because you had like these killer SWAT guys. And loved the original Halloween with Michael Myers and loved the over-the-top stuff like Evil Dead 2 as somewhat evidenced by this newspaper clipping here. Uh, this was for elementary school, uh, for a pumpkin carving contest that I entered into with an old pal in which we were awarded the most grotesque with their multi-stabbed character. So this was going one of two directions. This was going either serial killer route 
or this route, and, and I think my family, my friends, uh, law enforcement probably appreciates this a little bit more. Now, as macabre as this all seems, there was something a lot more family friendly uh, that I was into. Um, being raised here in Southern California, always obsessed with theme parks, Knott's Berry Farm, Disneyland. It, it, back in the day, uh, with Disneyland, we weren't able to go all the time. We went like maybe once a year. I mean, we didn't have annual passes or anything like that. So whenever we went to Disneyland, it was a real treat. And so when I couldn't be there, I would just imagine what it would be like. And I'd draw these crude pictures of the rides, of the maps, just to, again, to imagine what I could be like uh, living in those worlds when I wasn't there. And these photos here are from Knott's Berry Farm. It's from the original Knott's Berry Tales ride. Um, it's actually being reimagined and reopened later this year, but any Knott's historian can tell you that the original Knott's Berry Tales ride closed October 31st, 1986. These photographs that I took were taken the, the first week of November 1986. My mom, my sister, my friend Jared and, and I, uh, we went to Knott's Berry Farm just for fun for like our annual trip or whatever. And Jared and I headed over to the Knott's Berry Tales ride uh, just for fun, right? And we get there, and there is a chain blocking the entryway. We're like, what? I remember asking a couple of the employees, I'm like, hey, is this ride opening later today? And they're like, ha ha, kid, beat it. This ride is closed for good to make way for a dinosaur ride. We're like, no way, we love this ride. So what do we do? We hop that chain, walk up the ramp, and walk into the ride and start taking all of these photos of the pie factory of the frog forest of the fair and in fact that is jared right there next to the crafty coyote inside the frog forest now we did get caught so don't do those things uh, but knott's berry farm was uh their their security was gracious enough to allow me to keep my little 110 camera so i could get those uh, that film developed and share these pictures with you guys all these later years later i'm pretty sure these have to be some of the last known photographs of that original ride because it was immediately destroyed to make way for kingdom of the dinosaurs but there was a photograph that i took that day that i kind of became like fixated on because there was something inside that photo that didn't match it like i'm like what is that doing there like i barely even remember taking the photo but once I got this film developed, I'm like, that does not match this happy-go-lucky Knott's Berry Tales. And I'd ask, like, friends, my mom about it. I'm like, what's this doing in there? And they're like, I don't know. But I remember asking Jared's dad, and I handed him the picture, and I said, do you know what this item is doing inside the Knott's Berry Tales ride? And he took the picture and looked at it and said, oh, that must be for their annual Halloween event. And I'm like, their what? I'd never even heard of it. Well, the following year, October 1987, I attend for the first time and discover something named Not Scary Farm. And I remember going through the main gate of Not Scary Farm, and we headed toward Ghost Town, kind of went to the right, we went down Market Street, if you guys know where that is, and by the time we got to the general store, I ran inside to escape from these sliding monsters attacking me. I was petrified. I'd never seen anything like it. But I quickly gained my composure, braved going back into the midway, and then we went through the haunted shack, the mine ride, and the log ride that night. And that was my first experience at Not Scary Farm. But the following day, and the subsequent weeks and months, it really stuck with me. It had an emotional impact on me because it terrified me so much. But it had all of these things that I absolutely loved. It was a theme park. It was monsters. It was Halloween. So that began my love affair with Not Scary Farm, and I have attended religiously every year since. Um, these are some photos with me and my pals, my crew who would go to Not Scary Farm with me every year. By the late 1990s, um, something named the Internet became a lot more readily available for the average consumer, and I got myself a big old gateway personal computer so I could browse the World Wide Web and search for things that I liked. And so I would search for not scary farm stuff, but there really wasn't very much out there. And 
Uh, one of my friends who I'd been going to Not Scary Farm with all those years, a guy named Mark, Mark, who he's actually in that photo to your right, but he's all the way to the left with that like washed out denim jacket. Uh, he grew up to become a professional web designer right there in the middle of that internet boom. And I remember telling him, I'm like, Mark, you know, there's not a whole lot on the internet about Not Scary Farm. I took all of these old pictures and I kept all the old maps. Why don't we make a website about it? And he's like, sure, that's a great idea. And so that was the birth of a website named ultimatehaunt.com. And so uh, this website launched in April of 2000. And uh, Ultimate Haunt is actually short for the Ultimate Halloween Haunt Experience. Anyways, uh, in addition to those photographs and those maps, we started connecting with fans from around the world. One of those fans I became very good friends with named Uncle Mike Hansen. And he had been going to Not Scary Farm since the very first year in 1973. And I had always been fascinated with what Not Scary Farm was like before I started going. But Uncle Mike is a weirdo like me, and he kept all his old pictures and maps too. So we published an interview with Uncle Mike, so that way he could share these stories and share these pictures with folks. And so all of a sudden, the website became more of a resource, and it became very popular very quickly. In fact, Knott's didn't even know how to handle it at first, because they'd never seen anything like this. This is way before like social media or anything like that. Uh, and this website was getting way more foot traffic than their official website. But we developed a very good relationship that has lasted to this day. And I remember one of the first things I asked of them is if they would allow me to interview a couple of their employees, a couple of their actors, for monster interviews. And so um, I remember having a conversation with my mom, just kind of brainstorming about like what this website could be. And I, I remember saying, I'm like, mom, how cool would it be if I could like interview one of the actors, one of the monsters? because I'd always kind of wondered what it was like to do that, and I never talked to them, and they never talked. Like, they were, like, ominous and mysterious and freaking scary. And so my mom said, yeah, you should interview them, but while they are in character. And I thought, that would be kind of interesting. That would be cool. Like, yeah, what do these monsters do when they're not at Not Scary Farm? And why are they scaring at Knott's Scary Farm? And so I approached Knott's with the idea, and they approved it as long as they could review every interview before I published it, which I had let them do. And I remember the very first actor that I interviewed for this, we kind of prearranged it, and he was a long time ghost town veteran. He knew everything about the monsters, about Knott's Scary Farm, and I emailed him these in-character questions for the interview. And his initial response was, I don't know the answers to these questions. I've never thought about it. Let me get back to you. And so we did, and so we started posting and publishing these in-character monster interviews. But elsewhere, concurrently on the website, we had something that's not really around very much on the internet, but they were popular back in the day, named a message board. So we had the ultimatehaunt.com message board, and so this allowed fans from around the world to communicate with each other about their favorite Halloween event. But also posting on the message board were like employees. But they were like talking about like chicks that they were picking up on at Knott's Berry Farm or having like coffee breaks at the backstage cafeteria, sometimes trade secrets. So that really kind of conflicted with those in-character monster interviews that we had elsewhere on the website. So we needed to clean that up. So I made a rule that if you're an actor and you're gonna post on this message board, you needed to do so in character. And so they did. But they were all over the place because you had all these maze monsters, you had all these different scare zones at the time, and there just really wasn't a lot of continuity. And so I wrote a backstory, a fantasy of Nazi Scary Farm named The Haunt Veil. And all that really was was taking some old Celtic folklore 
because um, my roots are Irish, and so I kind of knew a little bit about that stuff, about the veil between the living and the dead being the thinnest that time of year. And I mashed that with some of the content found in the old witch hangings about a woman accused of witchcraft named Sarah Marshall, who we'll talk about in a little bit. And then I started adding some other things that I would just find around the park, like the hanging vigilante and the backstory for the silver bullet roller coaster and stuff like that. And so that worked as the foundation, as the blueprint for the actors to follow while they were posting in character on the message board to kind of create continuity. So then it became the actors creating their own backstories for their characters. That had never been done before in a public forum. Knott's Berry Farm never provided that information to people. Knott's Berry Farm provided people with a mask and a costume and said, go scare people. But it was the actors creating their own backstories and their names for their characters. And so that information started to kind of spread almost in this like tribal way from one generation to the next about this Haunt Vale story unofficially within the monster community. And that continued at Knott's Berry Farm for nearly 20 years and continues to this day in the scare zones. Any of your favorite scare zone monsters, especially Ghost Town, if they've got a character name and a character backstory, it's the actors that created that stuff, not Knott's Berry Farm. I mean, it's only been within the last couple of years that Knott's has provided detailed maze backstories for their characters. But for the streets, it's still pretty much the actors doing it. Anyways, that information started to spread outside of Knott's Berry Farm to other attractions, other theme parks, other amusement parks, because they were hearing, well, this is the way the Knott's people are doing it. So in preparing for today, it's kind of fun to think back that that could all be traced back to those old stories and message boards on ultimatehot.com and really, at least in part, all the way back to my mom saying, yeah, you should interview these people while they are in character. Another thing about that message board is you had these fans who were commuting, communicating with these monsters in character. And then that was in the off season. And so then these fans could go see their favorite monsters live and in person at the event. You know what we'd call that today? Interactivity. Even though it was kind of a primitive version of it, that was all in that fantasy world. Uh, we had all kinds of fun things on that website. More history, games, we had a lot of online contests. Sometimes the grand prize winner would become a not scary farm monster for a night. So this was like sponsored by not. In, in fact, all these photos here are some of our winners with the monsters that they worked with. That photo in the middle, in the upper one with the blonde and the brunette, the blonde is a longtime Not Scary Farm fan and a very good friend named Suma, and she was a ghost town monster for a night. Uh, the person next to her is me, because I was able to finagle my way into this whole thing, and I became a Camp Snoopy gauntlet monster for a night, and I actually brought this to share with them. This is the, the prosthetic that I wore that one night on October 31st in the year 2000. So this was the very first year that uh, we, I did that. And I actually worked with this guy right there, uh, Gary. And so, uh, but by that time, I was now becoming friends with the monsters and with management. They would ask me, well, how come you don't work this? And the honest answer was, I didn't think I had what it took to do it. I would read all those newspaper articles of all the crazy things that Knott's would make people do for the auditions. I'm like, I can't do any of that. I was a music major in college, so although I was in the world of like theater and the arts and performance, not as an actor, I couldn't do that. I mean, in fact, in college, I enrolled into an elective of a beginning improv class just so I could try to get the chops on what it would take to successfully pass a Not Scary Farm audition. I took that class and dropped out the next day because it just wasn't my thing. Uh, but fast forward many years later, 
and now I'm friends with the monsters. I've got this website. Uh, I know management. Find out that they temporarily did away with the auditions during that time frame because so many people were returning year after year. They didn't need to do the auditions. And so that's when I got in. And uh, the person who interviewed me and hired me turned out to be the best boss that I've ever had in my life. Uh, a manager there named Craig Harold. Yes. And um, he actually offered me Ghost Town for my very first year, like me coming off the streets. That was pretty intimidating because like this is where the event kind of started. It's this massive scare zone. I don't even know what I'm doing. I don't know if I'm going to be any good at this. So I actually volunteered. I actually chose to get some more experience. And so I went to a much smaller scare zone named The Swamp. And so if you don't know about The Swamp, uh, it's now where Forsaken Lake is now, but there was actually a lake there at the time named Reflection Lake. And sort of the overall backstory was that there were these swamp creatures lurking inside Reflection Lake. A team of researchers and scientists went to go investigate. The swamp creatures killed all those people, turning the researches, researchers into animals and uh, the scientists into zombies. And so I was a, an undead scientist in the swamp. And I actually brought this. My original mask that I wore in the swamp, pulled that out to, to share with you guys, but I was finally a not scary farm monster. I couldn't believe it. And actually, my first year there, that was one of the last times that Knott's allowed first year street monsters to slide. And so I practiced sliding for months, and I successfully passed the sliding uh, test. And so here I was, a not scary for a swamp monster as a slider. And I remember, you know, my coworkers and I, we just went crazy with aggression that first night. I, actually, I brought these as well. These are the recaps that uh, they put over their sliding pads. So these are my recaps from my very first night of my very first year ever working Not Scary Farm. Uh, we learn a couple of things looking at these. A, I probably abused sliding as a scare tactic a little too much, probably a little over anxious, a little over energetic, but uh, we also learned that the surface for the swamp was a little bit rough. Uh, but I kept these as a fun memento. And um, the people, the people that I worked with, just incredible. I mean, just, I mean, lifelong friends, some of the best friends that I, I've ever had. And really, as a side note, for any of these attractions that I'm working on, I mean, you're in the trenches with these people. There's like a very tight bond that takes place. You're like going to battle with, with each other. And so even though I don't see those folks all the time, you know, when we do see each other, we lock eyes and we know we have that shared knowledge of what we faced all those years ago because let me tell you this is not easy work it's very difficult very rewarding but very difficult anyways around that time though i started working as an associate producer for a now defunct a subscription-based video magazine named haunted media magazine and so they covered haunted attractions across the country in these little sort of video segments. So this got me outside the, the Knott's bubble, but it also working as a writer and a producer on it, I was researching all of these other events and interviewing their owners and their operators and really getting good insight on how other companies were doing this thing. Now, that same production company produced a full-length documentary on Not Scary Farm named Season of Screams, which uh, it was sold at the event for, for a few years. I mean, you can probably find it for free now, like on YouTube or whatever, but at the time it was kind of a big deal, and I worked as an associate producer on that, and that gave me good experience behind the camera and see how these things are being produced. But anyways, spent a couple of years in the swamp, got some experience, so I decided, okay, now's the time to, to transfer over to the world-famous, not scary farm, scare zone, ghost town, and of course, it was my dream to do it as a werewolf, and so I was Rage the Werewolf, and I brought him, too. <laughs> So 
so that's my original Rage. I loved Rage so, so much. He was so unlike me. He was super witty, he was super high energy, he was like totally aggressive, and he was just awesome. But here he was, now walking the same streets as all these people that started this event so many years before. So it was a real big honor for me to do that. And then in 2005, I took a little sidestep. I volunteered to help uh, debut a new scare zone that was coming into the event named the Silver Bullet Mine Town. And so I was gonna be their icon character, the Silver Bullet Sheriff. And so they casted my face and made me this cool looking werewolf. And so I also brought him along as well, even though he's kind of crumbling. But this was an opportunity to kind of work more with like marketing and see how they're doing their things. So here's one of the prosthetics from the Silver Bullet Sheriff back in the day. And uh, yeah, it gave me more exposure to marketing and really see how they're doing their things. And around that time though, the higher ups at Haunted Media Magazine kind of dissolved. And so they parted ways. And so one of them, one of the founders started his own production company named, uh, he's named David Love. And he started a production company now named Hollow Studios. And so uh, through them, I started to write produce and direct 4D ride and attraction films. So picture things like a much lower budget, but things like Shrek 4D or Star Tours, but for like way smaller markets. But that got me to, that gave me exposure to the themed entertainment industry, to the amusement park industry, which is a lot different from the haunted attraction industry. And it also taught me how to engage guests through use of comprehensive storytelling. Each one of those films have their own story. A beginning, middle, and end that takes place in a very small window of time. So that's a skill that I learned then that I still use to this day, and I still work with Hollow Studios. Anyways, I spent that time as the Silver Bullet Sheriff that one year. I wanted to come back home to Ghost Town and come back to my beloved Rage. And so I kept that prosthetic. And so I was like Rage 2.0 now with that cool little prosthetic. I brought a Rage prosthetic. It's basically the same thing minus the hair. So here's the Rage prosthetic. And so anyways, here I was, not scary farm, ghost town, slider, a werewolf, to a prosthetic customized to my face. That was it. That was the, the peak, the pinnacle. And that's how I finished my years working at Not Scary Farm. And I loved every single second of it. I adored the people that I worked with. So let that be a lesson to you. If you're looking to get into this stuff, do it. Don't be like me, who was too afraid and too shy to audition. I wasted so many years because I was too afraid to audition. I deeply regret that. Be brave. Just step to the ledge and jump off. If you don't get it, just do it again. You're gonna, you're, you'll get it. So anyways, that was my time at Not Scary Farm. I loved it. And toward the end, though, I started getting a little bit more involved with the backstage stuff. I started conducting scare school, training monsters, training sliders, kind of see how things are on the inside. And also, working there gave me real world practical experience on how guests react in these types of experiences. I mean, over the years, I engaged with thousands and thousands of guests to really kind of study how they behave in these attractions. So I thought, well, geez, I wonder if there's something I can maybe do with that one day. But first, I took a detour. Uh, toward the end of me working Not Scary Farm, there were rumors that Cedar Fair might be sold. And if that happens, what happens to Not Scary Farm? What happens to our beloved Not Scary Farm? And so even though I had history outlined on the website and on Season of Screams, there were still some huge missing puzzle pieces in the event's history. And so before this gets sold or who knows what's gonna happen or not, I'm gonna buckle down and I'm gonna document the heck out of this thing. And I really realized quickly that this is not all gonna fit on a website. So I'm like, you know what, I'm gonna commit it to myself and I am going to write the history book on Not Scary Farm, which I did. And it took 
two years of intensive research, uh, 80 interviews of, of past and present employees, hours and hours on end spent like at libraries, going through microfilm, just to find anything, anybody that had to do with this event. No stone was left unturned, but luckily, not Scary Farm is still here for all of us to enjoy, and luckily for me, I got blessed and had a little bit of success with this book. I got to do all types of appearances and signings, and this was great because I could meet with the fans, these fellow fans, and share this passion with them because the book is for them. So that way, they don't have to wonder what it was like before they started. So that was a lot of fun. I also started doing haunt history tours on site. This was through Knott's. And all this was was a way to kind of share some stories revolving around locations still present at the park. Stories about the event's history. I worked there. I knew exactly the relevance of these locations and how important they were. So that was an opportunity to share those stories and kind of expand on things outlined in my book. But by this time though, this book started to get in the hands of other companies. And they're like, wait up. He said, here's a dude that knows like a ton about this world famous, very successful event. He's worked it, he's trained their people, he's produced some things. Why don't we give him a call and see if he might be able to help us? And so I started working with some other smaller companies helping them do their things. But one of the first companies I actually helped was Knott's Berry Farm themselves to help reimagine a classic maze from the 1990s that was coming back for the 40th anniversary named Dominion of the Dead. And so I worked with their designer, who's a beautiful, wonderful, one of the most talented people I've ever met, Catherine White. And she was the designer of the original Dominion of the Dead. She was brought back to design this new version. And all it really was was taking my passion for classical symphonic music, matching that with her passion for contemporary and fine art, and then our shared passion of these ruthless, super dangerous gothic vampires. And that was the basic premise. But I was working with Catherine on another concept for Not Scary Farm that year. And this was for uh, a small little merchandise area to sell this book and to do book signings. And we were gonna put it in a very large building which is the livery stable. Uh, I think it's the toy barn now, the craft barn now, uh, but it's there at the end of, of Main Street. The reason we wanted this smaller merchandise area was because wrapped around the sides and back inside this large building, we conceptualized a scare experience exhibit named the Haunt Museum. Now, if you went to Not Scary Farm that year, you know there was no scare experience inside the livery stable. Uh, the reason I'm sharing that with you is because for everything that I do that actually makes it to the light of the day, there's dozens and dozens of things that never, never make it. Uh, but anyways, Catherine got pulled into some other projects. Another super talented guy, great friend of mine, another designer at the time named Todd Fox, took over the idea of this haunt exhibit, this haunt museum. They're going to make it more of a, an exhibit along with uh, Jeff Shattuck over at Park Decor, and they placed it in the old bonnet shop there in Ghost Town, and that was the Haunt Museum. And of course, that's where I did the book signings, that's where I sold my book, I continued helping them with the historic content in there, especially that incredible timeline that was designed by, by my dear friend Eric Linksweiler. It was just incredible. And so it's fun to kind of think about that, that concept of this Haunt Museum. It was only supposed to be for the 40th anniversary. But due to its popularity, it turned into an all-year-round exhibit for three years. So Knott's Berry Farm now was finally embracing its rich, scary farm history. But around that time, though, other companies started to knock. And so that's when I started working with Universal Studios in Hollywood for their Halloween Horror Nights. Uh, very blessed to have been the first outside person, I think the only outside person that they've actually publicly mentioned, to work in a creative capacity with their creative director, John Murdy, and art director, Chris Williams. And the first thing that we tackled was their attraction named the Terror Tram. And so this was for the Purge Terror Tram. 
And so I've been very familiar with what they've done in the past, Terror Tramps, in terms of their pop-outs and scare stuff. So we wanted to do something different. So I spent days out there at the back lot with John Murdy and Chris, and we were just kind of sharing scare philosophies and ideas, and like, what can we do with this thing? And the thought occurred, you know, if the Purge were real, what would theme parks do? Would they build like a huge fence like around their park so people could go in and destroy everything? Or would they embrace it? So we really kind of like the idea that maybe Universal was like a proud supporter of The Purge. And so the basic premise was this is going to be Universal Studios' first annual Purge party. And people could get off the dangerous streets on Purge night and party the night away in, in, in the safe confines of the world-famous Universal Studios backlog. They could watch live video feeds of purging, food and drink, patriotic sing-alongs, and just an all-around wholesome good time. And then once they load into the tram, the tram takes off, there's no turning back. Well, then that's when they find out the whole thing is a massive ploy. The Universal frowns upon the cowards who fail to take part in their patriotic duty and purge. So in turn, these guests in the tram are gonna be purged themselves. Lambs led to the slaughter, and that's what's waiting for them at the back lot. And so, um, any person that's in this business could tell you that a basic fundamental in scaring is a distraction, a decoy. So we had the scare actors acting out in these vignettes, that were inspired by the world that the purge takes place in as opposed to like recreating specific scenes and of course those worked as elaborate decoys for the scares to take place we also tried using plants shills to be plucked from the flow of guest traffic so in the midst of this human auction plants would be pulled from the line of the audience bags thrown over their heads and they were thrown into cages and so the reason I'm sharing this is this is a good example of taking an attraction people are very familiar with, like the Terror Tram, and trying to do something different with it. Because what we're trying to do with any of these things are to create positive memories, even if it's a, a creepy memory, to try to create a lasting impression because this is the entertainment business. Part of that business relies on repeat customers. And so we really try to create these experiences that entice guests who want to return. So I worked with John Murdy on that, writing and scripting and doing audio, training the monsters, all kinds of stuff. And I also worked with them on their American Horror Story attractions and Ash vs. Evil Dead. And so for any of this stuff, it's just a ton of writing, a ton of research, and really, in that moment of time when I'm working on that, you become an expert in that property. So I'm always going to have a soft spot for things like The Purge and American Horror Story. I mean, I grew up and still am a die-hard fan of Evil Dead 2 and Army of Darkness. So to work on Ash vs. Evil Dead, one of my favorite horror icons ever, that was like a dream come true. It was just incredible. So what I've learned to, to do is to try and do something different with attractions, properties, experiences that our people are familiar with. Took that same sort of philosophy and applied it to an event that we helped reimagine a couple of seasons ago named Queen Mary's Dark Harbor. So this was with attraction designer John Cook, and uh, he was named the new art director, lead designer for Dark Harbor, and the idea was to reimagine it. He designed it, we worked on the creative together, I wrote it, and, and one of my favorite ones was is a maze named B340. And so B340 is supposed to be the most haunted stateroom on board the Queen Mary. And, but the attraction revolves around their character named Samuel the Savage, who reportedly murdered several people on board the Queen Mary back in the 1940s, and he supposedly died in that stateroom. And so before we got involved, this maze kind of explored Samuel's psyche and went through his brain and his childhood, I guess, to kind of establish why he became savage. But we wanted to go with more of a direct angle. And so we wanted to really take advantage of that beautiful interior on that incredible historic ship. So we set this whole thing in the 1940s in this kind of film noir type of way as we followed this hard-nosed gumshoe detective who is investigating these brutal crimes and the horrible things that he finds along the way. And so we applied that same sort of storytelling strategy 
to all of their attractions, as well as last year to Lullaby and a new maze named Rogue, and then as well as to all their attractions at their new sister event named Dark Horizon that debuted uh, in Orlando this past season. And so um, what I've learned from a lot of these things is adaptability, being able to adapt the narrative to fit within the given parameters. It doesn't matter if it's a movie property, if it's a ship, an attraction, it doesn't matter. Being able to kind of edge that story into the given guidelines, being extremely proficient in that is absolutely mandatory. And so, thankfully, over the years, that's a skill that I've developed, and these stories have to be easily digestible for the audience. And so, that's something that we tried to do uh, this past season on another event that we helped reimagine named the Los Angeles Haunted Hayride. I love that, that, that cool marketing photo of that werewolf, that biker werewolf. And now that you've known me now a little bit, you know that's me in that crazy costume because any chance I can be a werewolf, I'm gonna take it. Uh, but anyways, we try to do something different with this event, uh, something unique to the Southern California market, having the entire event revolve around one centralized story. That story is about this strange town named Midnight Falls. And it's strange because it's always Halloween night. It's always celebrating its 13th annual Halloween festival. It's always 1985. And so there's a lot of strange and scary things going on around this town. And one of the ways we tried to get that narrative across was through use of roaming characters in our open midway portion of the event that we called Town Square. And so we knew that we wanted these characters to be creepy, but we did not want them scary. Because we knew that if they were going to be scary, the people would run from them and not engage with them and not take part in any of this narrative. So we wanted this, this group to be uh, engaging and creepy. And so what I've learned with a lot of this stuff is to trust in the system that we put in place. Trust in our casting. Trust in our training. Trust in the actors. Trust that I've given the actors the tools necessary to help bring these characters to life. And so I think we're very fortunate with these actors that we casted for, for Town Square because they were really well received. I adored them. I thought they were really fantastic. And so it was, it was killer to watch them bring those characters to life. To one attraction that we worked on this past season, again with John Cook at Not Scary Farm, named Origins, The Curse of Calico. And so this is the backstory of Not Scary Farm's Ghost Town. And now that you've been hanging around with me for the last few minutes, you now know how big of a deal it was for me to be able to work on this. We had John Cook's incredible set designs. We worked on the creative together. I wrote it and it's like, oh my gosh, wow. I can go full circle now and revisit that old Haunt Fail story written on ultimatehaunt.com nearly 20 years ago. And so when they approached us with it's like, oh my gosh, here's the chance now to take that old unofficial story, fine tune it, and make it the official story of Not Scary Farms Ghost Town, which it is. It tells the story of, of a woman accused of witchcraft named Sarah Marshall, a botched hanging, and the curse that she places on these calico citizens, turning them into these horrendous creatures. And so just writing this was just fantastic, but what was really miraculous is watching all of the teams of people coming together to bring this to life. I mean, everybody from merchandise to marketing, all the way up to the, like the media guys, which was, was so fantastic, as well as all the people that were like building it, the carpenters, the lighting, audio, effects, on and on, the painters. I mean, I think a lot of these people kind of grew up with that unofficial story, so you really got a sense that there was like this shared mission to tell this story right. And, and let me tell you, none of these things are about one person. It's about these teams of people working together to create this vision. And wow, the actors I thought were really incredible. I mean, they did a fantastic job in bringing these characters to life. And I mean, I really do believe that these theatrically driven experiences fall back on the actors. We can have the best sets in the world. We can have the best set designs. We can have the best story. But if you have the wrong actors doing the wrong things, this could just fall seriously flat. Uh, 
Luckily for us, though, that didn't happen in Origins. I thought that they did a really great job. And really, I mean, anytime I'm writing these things or directing these things, I really do in my mind kind of revert back to my days as a not scary farm monster. So that way I can really treat the cast and the crew with the utmost respect and honor that they deserve because this is not easy and so it's my job as the director to give them the tools to succeed and i mean i don't want to get all like philosophical about it but isn't that what we're trying to do anyways in life lift people up and help them succeed because if they succeed i succeed the vision succeeds i'll talk about success in a second because i think everybody kind of has their own sort of definition of it, whether or not it's fame, fortune, Instagram followers. I kind of like to look at it in a different way. Uh, I, I did not take this photo. I just found it on the internet, but I really liked it because we can't tell if we're looking forward or if we're looking behind us. And kind of prepping for today, I thought it's been, it was a lot of fun to kind of look back in the rear view mirror on some of this stuff because really, uh, I think it's important to respect and honor the past. It's made me who I am right this second. But in this business, we always have to keep moving forward. These attractions, they're seasonal. They come and go in a flash. And so we have to always be going on to the next thing. And I kind of wanted to figure out like how I wanted to conclude today. So I wanted to leave you guys with a quote that means a lot to me. It does address success and I agree with it. It just says it a lot better than, than I can. Uh, if you're not in this industry, hearing this quote will probably give you a little bit of an understanding on where I'm coming from. If you are in this industry, well, maybe this quote will help you as much as I hope it has helped me. Uh, I do believe that these uh, experiences that I work on are forms of performance art. They are art pieces. And so if that's the case, the people who write these things, create these things, the actors, all the people that like build them, they are artists. So I leave you with this quote. Any great artwork revives and readapts time and space. And the measure of its success is the extent to which it makes you an inhabitant of that world. The extent to which it invites you in and lets you breathe its strange, special air. That was not said by th some theme park guru. That was not said by some haunted attraction person. That was said by famed composer, conductor, and educator, Leonard Bernstein. This is what I'm trying to do create experiences to have the guests go into these worlds and explore, lose themselves inside them, forget about their day job for a little bit. I also still need to keep in mind the business aspect of all of this, so I want these people to return. And a tradition is born, because at the base of everything that I work on, it is my desire to make people feel the way that I felt all those years ago when I was cowering in the general store at Not Scary Farm from the monsters waiting for me in that fog. I really do think it's, it's good to look back at the past every now and then. I mean, each one of you have your own story as to why you are here right now. For me, I know that even though the, the, the subjects I work on are typically macabre and dark, for me, it's about trying to make someone feel exhilarated in that moment, and that life can be very, very bright. Thank you guys so much. It's been a pleasure and honor. Thank you guys. Come introduce yourself if I don't know you so we can become friends. Thank you guys. Have a great day.